Hi, I'm Matthew Francis. Thank you for tuning in to Diversity Dignified. Um, on this program, we address any issues that pertain to gender equality. And so tonight, I'm really honored to be interviewing Dr. Matthew Fox, who is here in Portland, Maine. He'll be um, speaking about ecological and gender justice. He is the author of 33 books with uh, another on the way. And these books have been translated in 63 different languages. He's also the founder of the Fox Institute of Creation Spirituality, which is in California, with, I believe, another one on the way in Colorado. So without further ado, I will let him establish his own credentials, and we will, we will just start. Um, Dr. Fox, thank you so much for being here. Uh, welcome. Um, one thing I think viewers probably are aware that you are an ex-priest, that you were in the Dominican order for 34 years, I believe. Right. You were um, silenced uh, by Pope Benedict uh, in 1993 for uh, sort of the resurrection of creation spirituality. And I kind of think that that was sort of ironically providential. And I'm sort of wondering maybe what you did during that time and how you kind of came around doing what you're doing. <laughs> well, first of all, Matthew, thank you for having me on your program, and thank you for ever having a program like this. Yeah. I appreciate uh, the journey you've been on. It's not been easy, but as you, you lay it out in your book, which I appreciated very much, it's, uh, it's a story of hope and of courage. Thank you. And I commend you for that. And the many, the many valleys, valleys you've been through I think have clearly made you a stronger person and more, uh, or should I say, endowed to be uh, an instrument of compassion with others because it begins at home, compassion does. So I just commend you for your own journey Thank you. and for your recent book, which I, I truly profited from. As far as my own journey goes, yeah, it's had its bumps. I think everybody's journey has some bumps. I love the line from Joe Campbell, none of us lives the life we had intended. Exactly. <clears throat> so that makes life much more interesting. Sure does. But it does keep you on your toes too, mm -hmm. doesn't it? So anyway, yes, I was silenced for a year by, um, actually it was under Pope John Paul II. Okay. But Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict, was the instrument, he being the chief inquisitor, uh, who John Paul II um, enabled. And you understand, they silenced 106 theologians in their 34-year oh. papacies. I was just one of 106, so I have to be humble about that <laughs> badge of honor. <laughs> but uh, the first I was silenced for a year, and um, their objections to my work were first that I'm a feminist theologian, secondly that I call God Mother, though I proved that all the medieval mystics call God Mother and that I prefer original blessing to original sin. Mm, huge. Huge, and that I don't condemn gay, gay people. Mm -hmm. That's pretty huge too, as yes, you know. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and that I work too closely with Native Americans. Those, yep. those are the five uh, uh, objections or heresies, supposedly, that were laid on me. But um, yeah, I spent that year mostly traveling. I went to Latin America to see base communities and liberation theology in, uh, in work, and I met people there who have been silenced, such as Leonardo Boff, a liberation theologian in Brazil, mm -hmm. Bishop Casa de Galida, a wonderful bishop and poet and mystic and prophet in the Amazon, who was uh, working with the um, leaders of the Amazon tribes and so forth to defend the rainforest and to defend the tribes. A wonderful and very holy man. So. Um, it, it was, a, a, in fact, the only sabbatical I've ever had in my life. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, it didn't give me any money or livelihood because right, I was not allowed right. to teach or preach or write or anything. But, fortunately, I got a, a grant, and uh, I was able to survive that year. And um, when I came back, I spoke first at a 
called the Action Group to 2,000 people in Chicago. It's kind of a group of progressive Catholics. My opening line, which I received in a dream, was, uh, as I was saying 14 months ago when I was so rudely interrupted, and uh, people liked it, but not in the Vatican. <laughs> and about four or five year years later, they expelled me. So what, what is, I mean, what is um, so off offensive about an original blessing? I mean. Uh, well, that's a very good question. I would ask the same thing. But um, Western Christianity, since St. Augustine, Augustine invented the idea of original sin, mm -hmm. fourth century. It was the same century that the church inherited the empire. So if you're going to run an empire, original sin's a real good idea. For sure, keep you in line. Keep you in line and get you all confused about whether you have a right to be here or not. Sure. Uh, but Jesus never heard of original sin. Right. Je no Jews ever heard of original sin. And so I just pointed this out in my book, and it was not well received by, the, by uh, not just the Vatican, but a number of um, right-wing uh, Christians, because uh, sin uh, seems to be the way many Christians approach uh, the person in the story of Jesus. But I, creation spirituality is very different. We begin with the original blessing, and that is to say that creation that brought us here, us meaning us humans, it has blessed us all these billions of years. Yes. And we know that scientifically now, but we, we also know it, our ancestors knew it. The, the Jews knew it. Look mm -hmm. at Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. Everything's good, everything's good, everything's good. And when humans come along, it's a very good. Mm -hmm. Well, good is the blessing is a word for goodness. Mm -hmm. So, um, but again, it's political. Mm -hmm. It's political that original sin has has taken over the mindset of Western Christianity because it has served empires right up to today. Shame and fear. Shame and fear and guilt yeah. and, uh, and you don't have what it takes. I believe that the secular version of original sin is consumer capitalism. Yes. Because they're really saying the same thing. They're saying you don't have what it takes. You gotta buy this, you gotta yep. get salvation from outside yourself. Yeah, if you're not producing or consuming, you're not really worth worthwhile. You don't really exist. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The young and the old yes. experience that. And, of course, the those with handicaps, be yes. they physical, mental, yep. or, or something else. So, And then, of course, also, original sin was never really defined by the church. It's just this vague thing. Mm -hmm. Now, for Augustine, it was about our sexuality. Mm -hmm. It really was. And that, of course, is pretty dangerous. But... Um, the other, but it was left vague, and so I think that gay people come into the world and they, they pick up the message, oh, it's an original sin, it's a sin to be gay. Yes. Especially when that's what some churches are saying. Or transgender people, people of color in a racist society, mm -hmm. women yes. in, a, in a sexist society. So again, like I say, it's a way of keeping order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. Um, it's not about freedom, it's not about grace, it's not about beauty, and, and it's, it's not about empowerment. Right, and it's collapsing. I mean, people don't want That's to right. feel horrible about themselves. <laughs> imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> I hope you're right. I hope it's collapsing. I mean, some people do. Uh, Adrian Rich, the great feminist poet, says that many men have a fatalistic self-hatred. Mm. And when I look like at today's politics, I think, there's a lot of fatalistic self-hatred. Why are all these politicians in denial about climate change yeah. instead of wanting to do something about it? Right. Might it be fatalistic self-hatred? Mm -hmm. That they, when you hate yourself, as Jesus pointed out, you can hate everyone else too, oh, absolutely. including the earth, including the elephants and the tigers and the whales and the rivers, everything that's, that's dying with us. Uh, so I think there's some deep insight in Adrian Rich's comment that and, and I would add, I think original sin ideology, whether it comes from Western, from Augustine in theology, or whether it comes from the secular world in consumer capitalism, both of them are feeding yeah. this idea of fatalistic self-hatred. Yeah. And Jesus said, you love others the way you love yourself. So he's presuming that we learn to love ourselves. Right. Well, good parenting mm -hmm. and good, um, uh, a healthy culture. Right teaches people, and especially the young, to love themselves, right. to develop their unique gifts and all the rest. You know, Dr. Fox, so <clears throat> in my book, I kind of start off um, 
were that I was really afraid of God. I didn't truly love him because I didn't know love because the templates I had were very angry parents. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if some of that is going on too. We, this is the templates mm -hmm. we learn, original sin, self-hatred, and we project that on yes. God. Yes, and the punitive father. Yeah. The studies yeah. have been done on fundamentalism and that keeps coming up. It's a punitive father yes. and a punitive father God. Right. And this is, of course, a reminder about why parenting, good parenting is so important. Yes. But it's also a reminder about how good, good theology is important yeah. uh, to be passing on genera generation after generation that God is essentially a punitive father who's judging you all the right. time and has a special place called hell to throw you right, into because right. you're so imperfect. Yeah. You know, it just goes on and on. Yes. It feeds a lot of sickness. And as you say, hopefully people are walking away from it. But in my opinion, they should be running away from yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. And the, the sooner the better. Yeah. So my job, I guess, as a theologian for 40 years has been to try to clean that mess up yeah. theologically yes. and ideologically. And uh, of course, we have the systems of psychology today and other sciences. And um, um, to say nothing of art and music, and you know, there's many ways to heal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's grief work to be done and the rest, and rituals. But um, we can't take it for granted that it's going to improve on its own. Because right. I think the, the punitive father ideology, which is really behind all fascism too. Fascism is about putting order ahead of everything else, law and order. Right. And um, life isn't like that. Uh, there's chaos in life. Yes. And there's, and there's creativity that can be born out of that chaos. And this is what we should be honoring is mm -hmm. creativity and rebirth. And beauty. And beauty and co-creation. Paul, St. Paul himself calls about our being co-creators. Mm -hmm. And that's very different from being um, a sinner with a capital S. Yeah. Well, the sinner, being a sinner to me, is so debilitating. Because <laughs> then you're just, uh, I really developed a severe OCD trying to be pure. Trying What's to OCD? Be obsessive compulsive oh, disorder. Okay. It was really trying to be clean, oh, trying yeah. to be pure, mm -hmm. trying, and uh, I would develop very elaborate uh, cleansing rituals. Uh -huh. yeah, and yeah. never could until finally I replaced this angry parent father uh -huh. figure with a more loving paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't call God father, but I know that the uh, Aramaic translation is mm -hmm. mother, father, birther, mm -hmm. creator, mm -hmm. universe, and spirit, which is a much more embracing, loving figurehead. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And bringing in the gender balance when it mm -hmm. comes to, um, to our names for divinity is very important. It's not a minor thing. No. Um, so calling God mother is important. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, Pope John Paul I, who was murdered after one month in the job, the day before he was murdered, he said this publicly. He said, God is both mother and father, but God is more mother than father <laughs> at this time in history. Wow. Because patriarchy has yeah. been so oppressive for several centuries. Yeah. And, uh, Meister Eckhart, the great 14th century mystic, who I've, I've written a lot about, a wonderful man, also a Dominican, uh, he said that all the names we give to God come from understanding of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if we're just um, passing on God as father, much less punitive father, mm -hmm. or patriarchy, then um, we're revealing that our own souls mm -hmm. are very unbalanced mm -hmm. and our institutions. Yeah. And look around us to see, see how lacking in feminine energy and wisdom, for example, education is in our yeah. culture, to say nothing of politics and economics and, and the media and the rest. So bringing this balance back is an essential part of healing yes. and uh, creating a, a society that's worthy of us and worthy of our children. Whether they be girls or boys, mm -hmm. we all have to grow up knowing 
that we have qualities of the feminine and the masculine. Right, the divine feminine, sacred there masculine. There you go, exactly. Yes. Yeah. You know, one thing, um, so I saw you not too long ago because I was at a retreat of yours over at Rowe Center, uh, and, we, and I learned a lot about the sacred masculine. Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest that that felt so refreshing because oh. it just felt, it feels to me like masculinity has been this sort of this tyrannical mm. uh, way of being. Um, and as a transgender person, um, it was really difficult for me to come to terms with uh, with being a male right now. Mm. Um, and oh, yeah. I kind of felt like, well, uh, women uh, sleep with the enemy, I became the enemy. <laughs> and it was really tough. Uh -huh. and, and then, because I had been trying so hard to be um, hyper-feminine, I went almost the other extreme mm. of being very masculine. And now I feel like I have just this wonderful blend of both. Mm. And um, the other thing that I think that you wouldn't mind me bringing up it is science and religion or, or people or faith are really coming back to get again. Whereas I felt like it was very divided. Mm. But I would say in the, in the last few years, at least to me, um, science is really backing a, a lot of what people of faith have been saying, like that we're interconnected mm -hmm. and that both the masculine and feminine are just beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you don't condemn homosexuality. There's a lot of evidence in nature that that exists. Of course. And that it has been with us since the beginning of time. They've counted 464 other species. Yes. Last I heard, that have gay and lesbian populations. Absolutely. So get over it. And the same with gender. People don't realize this. Um, you know, I wanted, uh, I was a kind of a fundamentalist, not quite a fundamentalist, but pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. And I needed to know this existed in nature. And you mm -hmm. want to know what some of my research found was that it's all over the place. <laughs> um, it's not just in plants and fish either. Um, there was a movie I saw, it was on BBC, uh, called um, something about, uh, animals that were hiding and basically it was two scientists from South Africa were, were it started off they were um, studying a pride of lions mm. and they thought they were studying male lions and mm. it turned out they were female lions mm. they had grown their manes out and mm. they were behaving like males mm. and oh the world's sneakiest animals is uh, the title of it uh, and it went on and they were studying deer who were behaving male mm. deer that were behaving like female deer mm. and so it turns out there's this whole transgender thing going mm. on uh -huh. In, in, yeah. in the natural well, world. It's, it's about diversity, isn't yes, it? Yes, <laughs> about, I always say if God didn't like diversity, why'd he make so much of it? Exactly, you know? exactly. So, yes. And yeah. you know, most artists like diversity. Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century mystic and saint, he says, uh, God is the artist of artists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and he says that, uh, you know, no artist hates their work. The poet loves her poetry. The potter loves his pots. You know, the, the painter loves her paintings. How could God, who's the artist of everything, hate anything? Right, right. So diversity is how, you know, getting into the artist's mind is one way of understanding, I think, mm. what the divine mind is, is really about. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a story about homosexuality that I, I think I'd like to share with Please you. Please do. Yeah. A couple of years ago, I was lecturing in South Korea. Okay. They translated about a dozen of my books. And um, it was a very, large hall, and it was packed, people sitting, standing in the corridor and everything. And it was three hours, it was a long afternoon, because of course I had a translator, after about each sentence or two, she would translate. The very last question, this young man stood up, and he said, I am gay, and I do not feel uh, welcome in my church here in South Korea, and he sat down. <clears throat> well, I launched into my shtick. <laughs> and I said, well, first of all, my Bible says God is love. It doesn't say God is heterosexual love exclusively. <laughs> uh, the uh, Native American leaders have told me that those who know the tradition know that uh, all the great um, chiefs had uh, gay people as their spiritual directors. Yes. And uh, that they're, because they recognize that gay people carry a special gift of spirituality to a community. And, um, and then, of course, I talked about science, that 464 mm -hmm. other species, and 8% of any given human po population can be gay, etc. And when I remember the last sentence that I spoke was something like, so if you live in a society of any kind that is homophobic and uh, worships a homophobic deity, you're in trouble because you're, sh you're, you're destroying spiritual energy. Yeah. And with that, I ended, and two things happened. My translator disappeared. Just <laughs> Boom, she went away. 
And the guy who had invited me, who led the whole afternoon, he came rushing up to me, he knocked over the lecture, he was, <laughs> and I, I didn't know what I had done. And he said, you've just dropped a bomb, you've just dropped a bomb. South Korea is the most homophobic culture in the world. Oh, okay. But he said, it's good, someone had to drop the someone bomb, it. and it's better that it be you, someone from the outside. Well, um, the next morning, I was traveling on a train with my translator south to, further south to a university. We had another talk. And she said this to me. She said, I want to apologize that I disappeared because there was no one there to translate when I was uh, signing books and stuff. You know. She said, but here's the deal. I'm a lesbian. And while you, I, while you were talking there, that last question, I could hardly translate at all. The top of my head was coming off, she said, because oh. I'd never heard a theologian, much less a priest, talk that way before. Yeah. And she said, as soon as you finished, I went to the bathroom and I cried for an hour. I bet. Which is really something, because this was a professional woman, very strong, sure. in her mid-30s. But wow, the power of homophobia. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's so stifling, uh, uh -huh. Dr. Fox. I mean, to have someone, to have people stick up for us, to, to know who our allies are, mm. is huge. Mm. And I, I fear uh, so many people are walking around in shame, mm. uh, you know, afraid yeah. of who you are, who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I love hearing the, that Native American culture embrace the sexuality, homosexuality. It also embraced being transgender because um, mm -hmm. We go back, we're called two-spirit, mm -hmm. and that's what the Native Americans referred to us mm -hmm. as two-spirit. Mm -hmm. And we were seen as the leaders and the sages to mm -hmm. make the wise choices. And of course, there were uh, tremendous responsibilities, but mm -hmm. also some privileges, you know, some balances. So. Well, definitely, an appreciation for the gifts yes. that come to the community yep. through people like yourself and others. And um, uh, yeah, and I think, I was telling you this in the car, I think, your, your biography that you lay out in your, in your book, short that it is, um, that you've suffered so many things, first of all with violent parents and then being in a mental hospital and all that and being treated that way and of course being on the streets and uh, all of it and then going through your own sexual identity as well. Um, then I think part of it has been an initiation into into a shamanism for you, that your leadership, including having a program like this, uh, I think comes out of a deep spiritual place. And I, I, uh, I should say I, I praise you for having the courage to step Thank up and, um, and, and deliver and share with the community. It's just, just what, what the Native people say, that, that uh, transgender people and gay and lesbian mm -hmm. people have a special gift for the community, and the mm -hmm. gift is spirituality, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a homophobic culture or church uh, is, is, as I say, shooting themselves in the foot. They're mm -hmm. depriving themselves of spiritual energy. I think, <clears throat> you know, I agree and even extend that. I think, um, you know, that we, if we cut ourselves out from people who are differently abled, uh, immigrants and refugees, mm -hmm. you know, anyone with any diversity, we're hurting ourselves. You know, we well, really clearly, are. Clearly, I mean, you look yeah. at American history. Yeah and its better side has been welcoming people yeah. of so many backgrounds, mm -hmm. and so many of them have gifted us with so much. An awful mm -hmm. lot of Silicon Valley inventions have come from immigrants. That's a good point. And yeah. uh, so uh, that's just the latest story. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and we are all immigrants unless you're Native American. Right. <clears throat> and you're here, another issue that um, to me is front and center. And I'm so glad you're here. It, it is our environment. It's in trouble. Mm. I mean, we've made some poor choices, and we are it's, we are wreaking havoc. Um, it, whether it's due to self-loathing or that we really just don't comprehend what the consequences are, I think 98% of the world's scientists agree uh, we're in trouble, and we need to double up, triple up, mm. or you know what we need to do to take care of the environment. So, well, absolutely, and. Uh the bottom line is, I think, that uh, we, we live in such a world, a human-centered world, anthropocentric, what Pope Francis has called narcissistic, yeah, yes. that w we're not realizing the pain that we're delivering on other creatures, whether yeah. we're talking about the waters or the soil or the forests or the elephants and tigers and the fishes and all of it. But you're right, the sci it's the scientist's job to gather the facts. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that the earth is extremely sick. It's now a hospital. Yeah. 
and of course climate change. Now I was invited to a conference a year and a half ago in Florida about the rising seas and, and climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, this was in January of last year. At that time, Florida had three significant politicians, two of them running for president and one the governor of Florida. All three were in complete denial publicly about climate change. Mm -hmm. But at this conference, it began with the scientist who got up and showed slides of Florida. Mm -hmm. He said, 10 years from now, chop. Then he showed mm -hmm. a slide of 20 years from now, chop, chop. 30 years from now, chop, chop, chop. Mm -hmm. Florida is going under. Yes. And you have three, yeah. Bush, uh, um, Rubio, and the governor, 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 in complete denial. Right. And I went to South Miami, there's six inches of water in the I sidewalks. Yeah. And it's not just about getting your feet wet. No. When, when salt water rises and, and then flushes down our freshwater tables, we're done. Yes. As a species, you can't grow plants no. and everything else. So, and what do you do with sewers and all mm -hmm. that? So it's uncanny that humans can, be, can choose denial about so important a topic. And that we have, frankly, at this time, it seems, a whole party in America right. that is committed to denial. Even though now it's interesting, Al Franken last week, I don't know if you heard this, you know, the Democratic senator said, behind closed doors in the Senate, mm -hmm. Republicans will admit climate change. Really? Yes. But that's even more pathological. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Because in front of the doors, right. <laughs> they're doing nothing and denying it. Right. So this is complete hypocrisy. Yeah. It's schizophrenia. Yeah. And it's, it's a sign that our politics are absolutely, you know, yes. off the chart. I hear from people saying, you know, <clears throat> oh, Matthew, it's, it's just evolution. This, is, was, this happened years ago mm -hmm. and stuff. And I guess my answer is, you know, evolution took thousands of years. Exactly. This has taken a few hundred. <laughs> and it's, be, it's a very accelerated evolution. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not taking a few hundred now. It's going to take a couple of decades. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, ask the people in Greenland. I was just, I just learned from a scientist this week. I've been in a science conference okay. out on Star Island uh, with scientists and, and a few others. And uh, one of them said, you know, they're now, they're, they're now grazing cattle in Greenland. Mm. Greenland used to be all ice. Right, right. So, and talk, of course, to people from the islands of the Pacific Islands. You know, these islands are being abandoned. Yes. It because uh, the because the salt water is taking Just over rising. the freshwater yeah. tables and uh, so these are the canaries in the mine yeah. and um, and then of course just check your the weather patterns yeah. uh, I just came from California a week ago and we had the hottest ten days in recorded history mm. and this was in June. Yes. Uh, so and then the number of hurricanes and it's all going to get worse. Even yeah. yeah. Because of climate change. Yeah. So again, humans. Uh, we're an, we're an amazing species, but it's not all good news. No, <laughs> we're no. capable of so much um, denial, living in our yeah. own worlds, yeah. and uh, and I think Pope Francis, you know, wrote a very fine encyclical on uh, ecology called Laudate Si. Um, I think he's absolutely right. It's it's a narcissism of our species. Yes, and uh, anyone with moral I instinct at all ought to be shouting and marching yeah. and demanding change. Right. And if we, we need to be it. stewards of this earth that we're, mm -hmm. as the natives would say, we're, we're, you know, we're borrowing from our children, our mm -hmm. grandchildren. Yeah. And we're not thinking with that in mind. It's just a exactly. very immediate gratification. Yeah. Uh, whatever we want, it will pay for the consequences later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and we're paying for them now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's right. You and know? later is yeah. going to be worse yeah. if you don't don't shift. Uh, I really like Naomi Klein's book. Uh, this is it. The title, the su subtitle is um, Capitalism versus Climate. Mm -hmm. But she did a tremendous job of interviewing all kinds of groups around the country, including indigenous groups, that are doing very positive work at the grassroots. Okay. And. Um, so it's very important to keep our hope up on this and, and to realize that people, many people are aware, many people are doing a lot. Uh, just uh, two days ago, I think 300 cities, mayors of 300 cities in America said, we're gonna uh, commit to the Paris uh, Accord. Oh, wonderful. And, and we're gonna make things happen. So in a way, it may be in kind of a perverse way that the president pulling out of that accord 
um, we'll get grassroots groups doing more, uh, doing more yeah. and taking responsibility. Because yeah. this is not something we can just expect to solve from no, the no, top. No. Yeah. And a lot of corporations uh, are smart enough, and even the Defense Department yeah. knows all about climate change. You know, like uh, they were saying that this week, these scientists, that they've been um, quizzed by the Navy. Because, of course, the Navy deals, you know, deals with water. Mm -hmm. And when, as the seas rise, and they know it's rising, everything's going to change for the Navy. Where are they going to park right. their ships? <laughs> That's true. The, the piers are underwater, yeah. all that practical stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the president can prattle on about whatever, whatever illusions he's living under. Mm -hmm. But those who, who live in reality, mm -hmm. I mean, he lives in a, on a tower, you know, with, with, with so gold. So removed from the average. With, so yeah. removed. Yeah. But even he will be affected when the air is no longer breathable. clean, <laughs> breathable, and water is yeah. hard to find, and, and the rest. So it's a pitiful situation, but it, it is shedding light mm -hmm. on the pathology of our civilization. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can imagine because in so many ways, uh, people who are wealthier can be removed about some things. Mm -hmm. But you know, the environment doesn't discriminate. When it has a hurricane, it doesn't care that you're living in a penthouse. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, That's right. And you know, I really feel, um, I've heard people make really careless statements like, well, you know, the earth is going to poop out anyways. Or, mm. But you know what? The earth is going to survive. It's us that, are, <laughs> that aren't. That's you right. Know? And we're bringing down a lot of other species yeah, with us. Yeah, yes. Which is that have pitiful. no say in any of this. No say in any yes. of it. They haven't voted yeah. for Trump yeah. or anyone else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're you know people do make up excuses. Yeah. But um, more and more people are waking up, and of course we do have a lot of creativity as a species. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can do, and uh, I mean you know in India they have a car that that runs on air. Mm -hmm. That's, I've that's wondered about good. like solar cars. Why not? You and know? more yeah. and more solar yeah. and and uh, the batteries that go with it and all that. But but we're not going to be saved by technology alone. We have to change our consciousness. Yes. We get out of our anthropocentrism and our narcissism, yeah. and realize we're in kinship with all these other beings. Yes. And the Earth is a is an interdependent system, as yeah. you said, and uh, we have to respect that. There's mm -hmm. a web. That we're part of here, and it's all sacred. See, that's what I think is the thing that's most missing: mm -hmm. that we don't. We've been taught to see the world in a utilitarian way, the yes. Earth, yeah. as something we're going to exploit and make money from, yes. but not as a relative. Mm -hmm. And the whole tradition of Mother Earth, and it's interesting. It's not only a Native American theme, but it's interesting that, po that Pope Francis brought it into his encyclicals. Mm -hmm. He's kind of adapted that language yes. as, you know, as, a, as a Christian. And that's important, that we recover the sense of relationship. Everyone who grows a garden knows they're in yeah. relationship with the earth. Well, I find this interesting. You know, I just want to emphasize to people, it's not a bumper sticker. It's a fact <laughs> that we are interconnected. And mm -hmm. thinking that we can oppress the environment or a group of people or, or, or certain plants or animals, it does impact us. Absolutely. You know, um, if, if nothing else, the potential of another human being that never gets developed, that could yeah. benefit us, you know, if you want to look at it from an ego point of view. <laughs> well, that know. too. Yeah. But, you know, we say we love our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, but we don't no. if we're not working right. that their life will have healthy air, soil, yeah. Water and numerous diverse species yes. to delight and instruct them. There's so, so it's many a going complete instinct. lie yeah. if we're not actively involved. Yeah. Uh, just don't give me that nonsense that yeah. you love your children because right. it's a lie. It is and an illusion. Yeah. You know, and as much as we complain about winter, for example, I can't imagine a world without having some snow. But <laughs> I don't think our children are going to enjoy that. That's one of the mm. things that's going to be g mm. gone. I've mm. read that recently, mm. you know. Um, there's so, and the, the species that are just becoming more extinct, more, they're not going to enjoy these things no. that you and I, for now, get to take for granted. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so I agree. If you love your children, if you love yourself, you're going to show that with the environment. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I do know um, on a personal note, once he pulled out, once Trump, um, President Trump pulled out, I woke up uh, redoubling my efforts. Mm. Like it, I, I thought I was doing a fairly good job and I guess I expected the government to take care of business. Mm -hmm. But you know what, they're not. Mm -hmm. And it is definitely up to us to step up to mm -hmm. the plate uh, post haste. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, well, exactly, yeah. as you say, to double our efforts. And yeah. I think 
you know, there is a lot of that going on. It the is. fact that 300 mayors got together yes. and committed themselves yeah. is, uh, is, you know, is significant, I think. Yeah, D definitely, definitely. Is there anything I should have asked you that I did not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't have any agenda. But you have, um, you have a new institute in Colorado evolving. Yes, um, I, right. I had my own university called the University of Christian Spirituality for nine years in um, Oakland, California. Yes. But now graduates of my program are starting, and I, le I left that several years ago, and I worked with the inner city kids mm -hmm. using, using our same pedagogy, which was so effective with yeah. adults. And it really worked. These kids are dropping out of school. And uh, I learned they're dropping out because they're bored. Yeah. Not because they're dumb. No. Our opposite. education yeah. is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> the kids aren't. Right. But um, so we, uh, my practice was to bring creativity in to the mm. inner city kids. And when we did, we took a poll, 100% wanted to stay in school. Why? Because they felt the joy of, of learning. Mm. The joy of learning is missing in a lot of our Absolutely. educational system. But um, yeah, so now graduates in my program have, are starting their own university, uh, but with the same pedagogy that I uh, initiated in, in the past. And they're calling it the Fox Institute for Creative Spirituality. I had nothing to do with the title, but <laughs> they're in charge, not me. But I will teach in it. And they offer a master's degree in spirituality, Christ spirituality, and a doctor of ministry degree, and also a doctor of spirituality degree. Mm -hmm. And the, um, it's, it's an intensive thing. So you come for one or two weeks at a time. So it's not about moving to Colorado. Yeah, so you don't have to relocate. Exactly, it's yep. not that. And then within a year, they'll have some classes, not all, I think no more than 40%, online as well and okay. they're trying to keep the cost down and all the rest oh, wonderful. but i think it's really special and important because we need a spirituality today for the very reason things we're talking about yeah. you have to be strong you know yeah. spirituality is, is about warriorhood it's and, not for wimps <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yeah. and uh exactly and um uh, so we need to be intellectually strong mm -hmm. as well as as if you will um psychologically and mm -hmm. spiritually uh, so you, we purposely, we train both left and right brain, the mm -hmm. intuition, which is mysticism, because we want to create mystics and prophets, mm -hmm. and the left brain that is intellectual and rational. By the way, there's something else I'm involved in, if you want to hear I want to hear, I do. I got a dream two years ago, and it woke me up at four in the morning, and it said, do it, with exclamation points. <laughs> what was the it? To start a new religious order that isn't a religious order, but a spiritual order. Okay. It's not beholden to any one religion mm -hmm. or headquarters, religious headquarters. Wonderful. But uh, the, it's built around uh, what we're talking about, ecology, because the name of the order would be the Order of the Sacred Earth, OSE. Oh, wow. And there's one vow that would bind the community together, and that, this is the vow. I promise to be the best, best mystic that is lover of Mother Earth. Wow and the best prophet or warrior defending Mother Earth that I can be. That's the one vow. And you can be Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Doesn't Hindu matter. or atheist yes. if you agree with this value system. Yep. And, um, and I have two 33-year-olds running it mm -hmm. because this is about the younger generation. Mm -hmm. This is a generation that, that has to step up. Yeah. But they need support from elders and others. Yes, sure. And so I see it as being intergenerational. There will be older people in sure. it, but the young have got to lead, and they should be empowered to lead. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're launching it. We're we're putting out a, a short book called Order of the Sacred Earth. Okay. And um, I've written a forty-page essay, and then one of these young people has, and then we have uh, about twenty people writing very short essays, like two pages, in response. Some of them names people would know, like David Corton and Brian Swim, the cosmologist, Mirabai Star, and so forth, and, but some young people who don't yet have big names. But um, this book will come out this fall, but we're excited about it. When I, I bounced it off people, especially young people, one 26-year-old, she said, this is exactly what my, our generation needs. She said, mm -hmm. we're so dispersed by social media mm -hmm. and uh, distracted, but to have something to focus on, mm -hmm. This is it, she said. We need a focus. Mm -hmm. And that's what a vow is, obviously. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but again, I learned the lesson from history that when I look at the history of, of the Christian church, it has often had times like today when its energy is run very low, mm -hmm. when it's not in good shape. 
but at that such times, usually an order popped up. Yeah. The third century had the, the desert fathers and mothers. Yeah. That was a new movement. Yes. In the sixth century, at St. Benedict and Scholasta starting uh, the, the monastic system. In the late 12th and early 13th century, you had St. Francis and St. Dominic starting their orders. In the 16th century, I think the Protestant Reformation was in many ways a birth of lay orders. And, and then you had St. Ignatius starting the, the Jesuit order. Mm -hmm. But I looked around today and there, there's nothing happening. <laughs> and so I say, well, but we should learn the lesson that St. Francis did not want his order to be controlled by the Vatican. No. But they took it away mm -hmm. and then he died two years later, I yeah. think, of a broken heart. I believe that, yeah. Within a generation, the Franciscans were running the Inquisition, mm -hmm. as was the Dominicans. So we got to learn from the shadow side here. Yeah that it shouldn't be beholden to any religious headquarters. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're ready for this today because of the great uh, gift of, um, of religious diversity yeah. that, is, that we are all um, uh, able to, to profit from today. So uh, we want to launch this thing and, and see what happens. Oh, uh, I wish you all the best on that. Well, thank yeah, you. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you take anyone. So you, you all heard that. Atheists, <laughs> Buddhists, Native American, Judaism, welcome here, as long definitely. as they will uphold the vows. That's right. And yeah. you can remain in your own tradition, sure, of course. Sure, sure. Right, right. Well, you can't uphold beat that. the vows. Yep. Exactly. And, and now, support one another. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I believe you have another book on the way, is that correct? Because I, I bought something, uh, Stations of the Cross. Oh, so Stations of the Cosmic the Christ. Cosmo yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh -huh. that? I haven't had the chance to break oh, it open yeah. yet. So. Oh, okay. Well, um, the archetype of the Cosmic Christ is returning. Uh, Carl Jung says that archetypes return when they're needed. Yes. And um, uh, this is an ancient archetype. It's the oldest writings in Christianity talk uh, about the cosmic Christ, Paul's letters and the Gospel of Thomas, both written about the same time, before the other four Gospels. And um, so this is an ancient teaching, but we really lost it because of our anthropocentrism and narcissism. But Paul says, for example, Christ holds everything together, the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Now there's, there's a parallel, parallel concept in Buddhism, the Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. And it's about the sacredness. The cause of Christ is about how every being is another Christ. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and the Buddha teach, uh, Buddhist teaching is every being is another Buddha. Mm -hmm. And in Judaism, every being is an image of God, not just mm -hmm. humans, but every being. So it's about recovering the sacredness mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of uh, all beings. And again, this is uh, a bit basic to all ecology, yes. I think. Uh, if you're going to develop a spiritual ecology. And um, so I had another book out this year on Thomas Merton, the great Catholic monk, who... Um, who got you in a lot of trouble. Who got me in a lot of trouble, because <laughs> he... I wrote him when I was a young Dominican and said, where should I go to get a doctorate in spirituality? He said, go to Paris, the Institute Catholic in Paris. And so I did, and there I met my mentor, Pierre Chenu, a French Dominican, older man, and... Um, and he named this creation spiritual tradition for me. So yes, I think I can say uh, Merton got me in all my trouble. So I both <laughs> thank you, Merton. I thank him and bless him yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. for making life not not uninteresting. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, to go back to the the Buddha nature you were talking about, I have a good friend named Tom Hendel who said uh, 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 a meditation that he uses is that he will, uh, I am, and then every single thing he comes into mm. contact, I am. I am the table, I am the, mm. the plant, uh -huh. I am. So that you see the, the sacredness of everybody if you are, <clears throat> and I find mm -hmm. that fascinating. That's yeah. how God answered, right, I yeah. am. Exactly, and, and that's part of the 16 stations. Seven of them are the I am sayings. You know, I am the good shepherd, I am the door. Um, I'm the resurrection life and so forth. These are not Jesus talking. Jesus didn't talk that way, the historical Jesus. Right. This is a cosmic Christ, which is to say the, the vision that the community had immediately after Jesus died and, and left. And, um, and so you can flip it. The question is, in what way are you a door? You are, mm. I am the door, how are you a door? Right. How am I a door? Right. How are we good shepherds? And at this time of ecological crisis, yep. It's very close to being a good steward. Shepherds yeah. care about the sheep. They have to. Sheep are very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so you go through all, how are you a light to the world? Mm -hmm. So it's a marvelous uh, practice. So there's the Stations of the Cross in Catholic churches and Episcopal churches. But these stations, and they are about the last 20 hours of Jesus' life. Okay. The, the undergoing the sure. pilot and his death and all that. But the, these stations are about the great um, stories around Jesus because they're all set in the Gospels around cosmology, yeah. including uh, Bethlehem and the Nativity, mm -hmm. including John 1, in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. including the baptism of Jesus. We're told the sky opened up. Right. You know, that's kind of cosmic. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> You'd say so. Transfiguration, when he went up to the mountain yeah. and they saw the, his radiance. Yeah. And even the crucifixion is not set in any of the Gospels in terms of this private thing about how, how, I, how I nailed Jesus to the cross and my sins did it all. It's set in a cosmic context. Mm -hmm. One Gospel says, you know, even though it was midday, the, there was a, a lunar eclipse, yeah. eclipse, etc. Or another Gospel that uh, earthquakes happened, people came out of the grave. Or another one that the, the temple uh, veil ripped. Yeah. And yet we know at that time that that veil had a picture of the cosmos on it. It was yeah. a universe that yeah. split. So all, and then the resurrection, the ascension, Pentecost, all these are set in a cosmic context, but we've lost the power because we've reduced them to psychology. Yeah. And uh, there's not the power there mm -hmm. that is to be found in cosmology. So the co this is part of the cosmic Christ. So this is a practice, and um, we have these two artists who created these, these icons. Mm -hmm. And now they're available in a, uh, you know, in a uh, two-dimensional form. People, one, one version is aluminum. Mm -hmm. You can put them on your church walls, your chapel wall, whatever. Uh, and the other is, is actually a high-quality paper photograph. You can put in an 8 by 10 inch frame mm -hmm. and again put it up on the walls. And so you walk, it's like a mini pilgrimage. You walk mm -hmm. from station to station, you pause and you meditate on yeah. each. And another thing that you can do in churches would be to have young people, children, maybe one group, teenagers another, young adults another, create their own stations. Yeah. You know? yeah. In other words, it's a way to invite artists yes. back to healthy religion, to make religion healthy again. There's an artist in Italy who's done her stations, for example, this, these 16 stations, and they're hanging in a monastery now in, mm -hmm. in Italy, in, the wow. outdoor, in an outdoor cloister, yeah. And it helps revive that ritual we've lost so much of, yes. you know. Yeah. Um, we need ritual so We much. do need ritual. I, I, Get out um, of our heads. I, yeah, I feel a personal appeal to ritual. Um, it's just, we've lost it, and I think that, that we're kind of just floundering a bit, you know. Uh, other cultures, especially indigenous cultures, you know, you go through these, and, and it does move you to the Absolutely. next phase. And Absolutely. I almost can't help but wonder if that's part of what's going on. That's, we've lost so much of that. Well, that's right. And all healthy ritual connects you to the universe. You mm -hmm. see, it's not just about psychology. Right. It's cosmology. Yeah. Just think, for example, of Stonehenge. Mm. You know, these people, thousands of years ago, before the invention of the wheel, dragged, got out of their couches and dragged ton, mm -hmm. ton, literally tons of rocks I know. to a place. Why did they do that? What motivated them? It was the solstice and the equinox. Yeah. It was our relationship to the cosmos. Yeah. And so if we're looking to get energy back, Yep. And you know, get out of couch potatoitis <laughs> and eating potato chips till we die. Some, yes. uh, ritual is yeah. a, look. Look at Burning Man out yeah. in California. Yeah. Sixty-five thousand people yes. come out in August in the desert. Mm -hmm. I mean, crazy. If they were reasonable, they'd go in March. But yep. no, August. Yep. But that just shows the 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 appeal of ritual because people are hungry today. Yes. Is you know, frankly, Western religion today has pretty much rendered ritual dead. Yes. It's all about reading prayers and getting on the right page. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the eyes, you know, Rilke, the poet, said this. He said, uh, the work of the eyes is finished now. Go and do heart work. Yeah. And all the images uh, uh, repressed within you. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, real ritual includes a body, as Native mm -hmm. people know, of course. Yes. They wouldn't bring a book to no. prayer. <laughs> right, right. They right. dance. Yes. And they sweat. 
You yes. don't bring a book into a sweat lodge. No. <laughs> and that's a purifying thing. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. I've even wondered on some level, because um, I smoked for 20 something years, and we all went out and huddled, and I can't help but wonder even if smoking was a form of our little fires. We had our little fires, uh -huh. we'd huddle around uh, speaking, and uh -huh. you know, that's what we used to do, is yeah. have big fires and, and talk with each other and yeah. dance and yeah. things. So. Well, yeah, when people don't get rituals from the culture, they do make their own. Dysfunctional we rituals. We get yeah. dysfunctional ones. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and you know, drinking and, and even drugs, you know, yep. there's, 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 there's a search for, for high, there's a search for ecstasy mm -hmm. and for transcendence, even yeah. in that. But it's not a very healthy way to go, no, it's, it's a rule. Not. Yeah. yeah. And I thought I read somewhere, or maybe I heard it from you even at the retreat, that you had worked with um, youth uh, with raves, they would do it uh, with Yes, raves. yeah, um, yeah, years ago I, uh, I realized we have to reinvent worship in okay. liturgy and bring the body back. Yep. And, and that the, uh, in the last 20, 20, 30 years, new languages have been developed, such as rap, you yep. know, new art forms, yep. rap, DJ, VJ. Yep. Why wouldn't these be used in worship? Sure. It's sacred technology, you might call it. Mm -hmm. so, so we started what we call these rave, uh, some people call rave mass. And I really, it was in Sheffield, England that it began. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, I know you yeah, spent time yeah, in Sheffield, England. Time. That's where it began. And I met these people. They flew over to yep. Seattle to meet me at a conference. And I was very impressed by what they were doing. And um, so we adapted it in America, our own way. But we've, and then that's when I became an Episcopal priest. The Pope fired me. Okay. And then I became an Episcopal priest. And I told the bishop, uh, Episcopal Bishop of San Francisco, I want to do it for only one reason, to work with young people to yep. reinvent forms of worship. Wonderful. We've done over 100 of these masses now. We call it the Cosmic Mass. Okay. And like we did it in the World Parliament a year ago in Salt Lake City. And, there were 400 people in the room and 200 more were banging on the door to get in, but I there was it. no room. So <laughs> You don't usually see that in church. No, you don't. <laughs> no. We did it at University of Colorado years ago. There were 1,400 people in, in, in the big ballroom there. And uh, yeah, it, it, it really is time. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I have young people in their young 30s uh, directing the Mass mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, overseeing it, and uh, of course I'm there too as an elder. But uh, yeah, we want to see this catch fire too. Okay. Um, and I think it's overdue, really. I Absolutely. Think. I think we need it, and all kinds. Of, like we did it for a thousand people in a Sounds True conference a year ago in the mountains of uh, the Rocky Mountains near near Boulder, actually. And um, there were atheists, there were Buddhists, there were rabbis, there were there were uh, Christians of all denominations. And um, it, was, it was really powerful for everybody. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, an atheist, this woman came up, she said, I am an athe a fierce atheist. <laughs> I'm so fierce that when I walk down the street and there's a church, I cross the street to go. <laughs> but, <laughs> she said, when we did this grieving thing, because we all, always include grieving, it's such mm -hmm. an important part of ritual today. It's so needed. She pointed to her heart. When we did the grieving, something happened in here, she mm -hmm. said. She said, by the time communion came along, I had to have some. She said, this night has transformed my life wow. forever, she said. Wow. So, you know, we've had a lot of happenings yes. uh, at these masses. So I know that it's uh, I it's love how, how you have the balance. Because one thing in your retreats, you, um, you've invited Ellen Kennedy and you do sacred circle dancing. Um, and as a result of that, I myself have gone to many sacred circle dances. And I do um, feel that is so important. and. So, yeah, young people are yearning for it, uh, middle age, all of us, we need it, we want it, craving it. That's right, it. Yeah. that's right. And ritual, when you look at indigenous people, it's a marvelous way of bringing together the generations. Yes. And we need that intergenerational, intergenerational sharing mm -hmm. and wisdom today. Yes. Wisdom comes from the young and wisdom comes from the old. Absolutely. And we need spaces and, and forms in which this, this can happen together. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so, um, yeah, th there's a lot that we can be doing today. Absolutely, and mm. you're still doing it. You don't believe in retirement the way that we do, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I talk about retiring the word retirement. Yes, I and know. And replace yes. it with refirement and rewirement. Re right, Re repurpose. Repurposing, Repurpose, yes. refirement, rewirement. Yeah, yes. that happens when you get older. And of course, there are a lot of older people today. We're living longer. Yeah. And uh, they have a lot to give. They we do, shouldn't yes. put them on shelves, and we shouldn't put them all in one, one 
place like a ghetto no. with only their, only playing canasta and going golfing. Yeah. That's not, young people need elders and elders need young people. And you know what, no matter who you are, you need purpose. That's you right, purpose. that's right, yeah, yeah meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, as we've talked about, there's so many needs out there mm -hmm. that uh, no one can, can be sitting this out, no. all hands on deck, yeah. if we're gonna survive yes. because the ecological crisis is a, is it a wake-up call? Yes, it is. Yes, you you don't get to opt out on that one. Exactly. You know, unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, maybe. Yeah. 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 Yes. I've so enjoyed this uh, discussion with you, and I really want to thank you for being in Maine um, and and giving this much-needed talk tonight. So. Well, thank you, and thank, thank you. you for your invitation. Thank I enjoyed you. the talk too. Thank you. Well, viewers, um, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you learned a lot and. Um, it's unfortunate I can't air this before this this evening's uh, speech that you're, that Dr. Fox is giving, but you are hearing the interview, and please know that um, our environment is in trouble. Let's make some choices to help her out. So thank you so much for your time and your interest. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.